had never really been interested in directing a Friday the 13th movie. Because I thought, you know, part seven, are you nuts? What film series prior had the gall to put a part seven on the film? And it dawned on me, maybe we could do something that they haven't done before with the character and the story. Ultimately, we settled upon a match for Jason, someone to, uh, to really be his foil. And uh, that foil was a clone of Carrie. She was like a normal girl that had had something strange happening with her, and she was generating energy and psychic powers. She immediately had a grasp of the character. She had the sensitivity, and I felt like a real bastard making her cry all the time. Really, the psychics I met with were trying to teach me not to make her psychic ability what you've seen in movies. It's not, mm, you know, this crazy body shaking thing. It's just a thought will come into your head and you'll react to it. And it's not necessarily the big fake psychic looking stuff we'd seen in movies. And that's what I wanted to come across. She was like a normal girl that had had something strange happening with her. Acting through a ton of rubber and a hockey mask ain't easy. So I really wanted to get somebody who could give us some new guts, some new blood, and, and that was Kane. John Beekler and I have done quite a few things together. He's one of those guys that I really enjoy working with and, you know, just a very creative guy and secure enough in his abilities that he listens to my input. I wanted to put every scar, every slash, every nick that he had had from all the previous movies. Just the amazing feeling of putting that whole thing on with the mask. It really was surreal when I was on the set for the first couple days. I really couldn't believe I was there. Some people just play a monster, just, I'm a monster, you know. And he was acting within the suit. You could really see his eyes, it was really creepy. Kane and I had done a movie years ago called The Hills Have Eyes Part Two. There was a moment where I'm running in that, you know, in that movie and I yell out to the girl, Cass, who was the lead girl. And um, there's a moment where um, Tina and I are running away from Jason now. It was so familiar to me. It was so like just yesterday. I remember yelling out, Cass, that's the wrong name. And, and Kane just takes off. What the hell was that? Where'd that come from, huh? There was a renaissance in makeup effects during that period. Everybody was doing stuff. When one of the kills happened, they would always film everything. The, if it's a knife, you'd film the knife going in, the knife coming out, the blood squirting, the person, you know, every little detail. So th there are these scenes or, or parts of scenes that at one time existed that are, are far glorier and, and more graphic than exist in, in the finished film. They were removed by the MPAA. We'd get, you know, an X rating and we'd say you'd get notes on what, what was wrong. And, okay, so oh, you shouldn't see the uh, ice pick uh, go into the eyeball. You shouldn't see the axe go into the skull. You shouldn't see this, that, and that. Okay, you cut back, cut back, cut back. We kept sending it back, and so I'd do the notes, get it back, and then we'd get it back, and there'd be new notes of like, well, this scene doesn't, this is too much, and this scene, and I, wait a minute, they didn't mention that scene before, and, you know, they, they don't make ex explanations for what they do, they just say, well, no, this scene is no good. My first death was the fabulous death that John Beekler had conceptualized and it was very gory and graphic and um, of course that gave the movie an X rating it's kind of disappointing because it's really um, reduced to you know leaving it to, to your imagination the makeup effects people do so much good work and it never makes the movie sometimes we built a mechanical head with collapsible understructure that was plumbed with all kinds of hoses and gore. 
where Cain could actually squeeze the head down to the size of a walnut. Blood was spouting out like a Sam Peckinpah movie. It was gorgeous. Uh, I thought for sure I'd be able to keep that in because it was so over the top. It was almost funny. It's in today's world of, uh, of gore on film, you know, certainly what was filmed back then would, have, would probably be considered quite tame. And, um, you know, it's just a bit amusing to think what you see now and what they were objecting to back then. One of the things that's, that's missing in, in the movie that I wanted initially, but ultimately was never allowed to do, when Lar is driving the car, she is supposed to have sort of a clairvoyant flash of her mother's death. My initial idea was to have little Jason from the first Friday the 13th movie, the little boy that drowned, holding Betsy Palmer's head with Betsy Palmer speaking. I think that would have given a, a moment to the fans to say, that's cool, that's real cool. And, uh, but my associate producer axed it immediately as being too over the top, nobody will get it and you're stupid. So we just had Susan Blue being stabbed. The actual death scene that uh, occurs with Susan Blue, uh, there, there's chunks missing. Uh, you actually see the, the uh, the piece go into her spine, you actually see it come out of her, you actually see a blast of blood come out and hit Dr. Cruz. He was a little bit bloodier in one of our takes. I'd hoped to be able to show a little bit more of what actually happened to Dr. Cruz because we did actually get this spinning saw injected into his midsection and we actually saw uh, some of his stomach and intestines pulled out and wrap around the blade. That was the one kill where everybody was cheering for it. And I just wish they had showed more of what we did. Now the sleeping bag wasn't so much of a gore makeup. It was more of a violent thing. It is a popular kill. It happens to be my favorite kill that I've ever performed as Jason because just be with the originality and creativity of it. And I had to rely really on Kane to pick up several gallons of blood and bash it against a tree that had little tiny razor blades in it so that it would <laughs> spatter a bit. The combination of the latex, the wetness, and the slippery nylon sleeping bag made it almost impossible to grip on it was just so hard to do that I started getting pissed off during the take. I swung it a couple times, I felt like I was losing my balance, and I, the thing was slipping out of my hands. So I ended up getting pissed off, and I think that even helped because I really smashed it against a tree. So I just thought it was hysterical. I mean, you know, just look at that bag. It's just oozing blood and oh, whack, whack, whack. And finally, it's almost as if he got too tired and couldn't hit it anymore. Literally down to the very end of our battle with the ratings board, that sleeping bag scene just kept coming up. It, it occurs to me that the uh, most effective cut of the sleeping bag was just the one hard hit and the throw down. The way my character originally died, uh, we filmed that in Alabama, and what they did was they made a fake chest for me uh, to wear underneath that t-shirt, and apparently in the dailies, when he hit me with the machete, the whole torso kind of shifted, and they said it was really obvious that it was fake and it didn't look good, but we didn't know this till we got back to L.A. It's like, eh, he's killed people with machetes a billion times. We, we need to come up with something that's a little bit more interesting. And that's why I like collaborating with Kane. He says, let's throw her through a window. Uh, <laughs> and then we came back here, and we um, went back to that house that they originally shot uh, number four in, in Topanga Canyon. And we reshot the, the way it is in the movie now over there. And then, of all things, they hired a stunt man. They put a wig on this guy, a red wig, and they put an exact duplicate of my top on him. But, you know, he had these shaved, giant, muscular legs as he was falling out the window. <laughs> there was a very attractive young stunt woman who was thrown through that window. Uh, and believe me, I saw a lot of them because they had to be almost nude. Maybe she had very muscular legs, but uh, they were feminine.
they were using Harry's previous music to library part seven. So I tried to take the spirit of what Harry did and create my own spots in the movie that had my own themes, my own thematic motifs. And most of the time I was pretty safe. And there was actually only a couple of cues where one of Harry's sort of faded and a new one of mine faded right up. It's a tough one because I didn't want to go too close because I, I would have felt that I was invading his turf. So I really tried to keep it true to myself, but that it wouldn't be jarring for the listener. The entire finale was very carefully thought out and very carefully storyboarded. There were so many more stunts for me to do. Went through a window, went through the stairs, went through a wall. It was great from a stunt point of view. The porch falling on Kane was challenging. I was terrified that this massive structure is going to come down on him, but Kane, I knew it. It was a big challenge, but it, because of that, it was so much more fun. I think toward the end of the filming process, there got to be a lot of cooks in the kitchen. And um, Beekler's vision the whole time through was, you know, very detailed and very clean and very specific. And he knew what he was doing, knew what he wanted, knew how to get it. The, there were a lot of compromises uh, made in my initial vision of the film. One of the big compromises for me was where Jason ultimately gets his. The letdown is that a guy wraps a chain around his neck and pulls him underwater. We had actually created this, this, this apparition, which was a version of John Otren's character, Tina's father. John Carl had all these different scenes of where I was coming to life Finally, my daughter brings me back to life, and I save her. So there were quite a few different scenes. Uh, also, the version that he had, I was to be in three different types of zombie dead. You know, he had rotting face where you could see bones through his skin, and really looked pretty believable. We were never allowed to shoot that. It was deleted from our schedule by my associate producer, because she hated the way it looked. As far as I knew, nothing was going on between the producer and the director because John was under such pressure to get so many things done in such a short period of time. That was a big disappointment for me. Right now, it's, it's so anticlimactic after all that, that these characters have been through for just a, a guy to show up and pull him underwater didn't make any sense. You've got two zombies now in Crystal Lake. You've got a bad zombie with Jason, and you've got a good zombie with Mr. Shepard. So, I, you know, when I left the, left the shoot, I was saying, wow, what a way to do a sequel. Very often I have thought of doing Friday the 13th, Part 7, Volume 2, which would follow what happens to the characters. What we didn't really see was the final scene where Jason actually resurrects from the bottom again. He comes up and kills a fisherman, uh, and he's back. Were I to have the opportunity to do this, I would have followed uh, Tina's story as she is taken back to the asylum and accused of all the murders. We would have a whole new story where Jason goes in after the inmates and the doctors and the nurses. That would have been fun. You know, I think people also like a continuing story. We crave that. That's why the soap operas work. Well, you know, uh, might be a good idea. Uh, it was always a good battle between the two of them. She did survive, so could have come back and done something else, and then I could kill her. <laughs>